Hi, everybody. This is James Tompkins, and welcome to Lecture 12 of the International Finance Series, Economic Exposure. And to give you the agenda, which I usually do, I'll start off with a summary to date, and then we'll get into the actual topic. So this is how I usually start every single lecture, and that is to get into why are we doing what we're doing, okay? So for a change, I thought maybe I'd put in writing. And so what, is the, what has been the overall theme of this class? Basically, international financial principles as it affects firm value, right? And so value is a function of what? Risk and return, right? And so therefore, why have we spent the first half or the, or the several first lectures in this whole series talking about why the dollar goes up and down in value, and for that matter, other currencies, because we've used the dollar as a, a platform from which to also discuss other currencies. Well, to the extent that the dollar goes up and down unexpectedly, is that a type of risk? It is, right? And so, you know, theme of the class, international financial principles, as it affects firm value, value is a function of risk and return, well, a risk that you might associate internationally has been exchange rate risk, and so we've spent the first half of this whole series trying to understand why the dollar goes up and down in value, or why there are unexpected exchange rate movements being a kind of risk. So then I said, all right, well, our goal in the second half of this class is to look at managing this risk, managing it not just in the short run, but also the long run. Now, in the last lecture, we looked at managing this risk in the short run, and what kind of hedging instruments did we discuss? Do you remember? Well, does uh, forwards, futures, does that ring a bell? Well, in any case, we looked at things like forwards and futures and and options and money market hedges, and we looked at different alternatives in the last lecture, again, all, all in the short run, or all for a year or less. And, and by the way, why for a year or less? Why am I, in this case, not being wishy-washy about defining the long run and the short run? Well, because a lot of those instruments, those hedging markets that we were looking at, were only available for a year or less. So futures, for example, or, or, or forwards, you know, t typically. Now, I know options, you know, that they do have something called leaps, and, and they can go beyond a year, but they're generally relatively thinly traded. And, and to the extent that they're relatively thinly traded, does that mean they're going to be more efficiently priced or less efficiently priced? Less efficiently priced, right? So what we want to do today is look at managing this risk in the long run, and we're going to do it under the heading of, of economic exposure. And we're going to define economic exposure as being important, at least as it relates to firm value. Okay, so, so we'll define it that, hey, when there's a change in exchange rates, there's going to be a change in firm value. And, then, and that's what we're going to define as economic exposure. Now, can you think of any kind of economic exposure, therefore, that we've already discussed? Well, what about that example that we did in the last lecture, right? What we did was we took one single business transaction where a U.S. business person wanted widgets. But they didn't want to have to pay for those widgets from a Japanese supplier for 90 days. And so they would owe 100 million yen in 90 days. Now, depending on the exchange rate, 90 days later, would the firm either very likely owe more than expected or less than expected? They would, right? And so therefore, would firm value change as the exchange rate changed? It would, right? And we call that transaction exposure. Now, another kind of economic exposure is called operating and competitive exposure. Now, what is the difference between operating and competitive exposure? Well, basically, transaction exposure is contractual. In other words, a price has already been agreed on, it's fixed, it's not free to go up and down. So in other words, 
with that example that we did last time, the 100 million yen, that was the price, that was fixed, no matter what happened to exchange rates. But there's also another kind of economic exposure, and that's where a price has not been locked in. Okay, so it's non-contractual in nature. So let's think of an example. Can anybody give me an example where, let's say, you're an American firm, and all of your sales are in dollars, and all of your costs are in dollars. Okay, so in other words, you never ever have to change money. And yet, you could argue that the value of your entity, the value of your firm, will go up and down depending upon what happens to exchange rates. Any thoughts? All right, well, let me tell you what is almost a C story, okay? And that is, for those of you, by the way, who are just watching this lecture and hadn't watched any of the others, uh, my background, I have some merch marine in my background. Sometimes I bring up an occasional quote-unquote C story, okay? So in any case, I, I remember going back to what I call my, you know, carefree 20s, in my 20s and single days, and, and I was working in the Merchant Marine, and I had about five or six months of paid vacation every year, and I was making a lot of money, and so I remember getting these things in the mail, this was, this was in the mid-80s, and it was from ski resorts in Colorado, and they were practically begging me to come ski there. I mean, the, 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 the amount of price discounts they were giving were, were huge. And at the time, I thought, well, obviously, they, they, you know, I'm getting this stuff because they, they know the kind of money that I'm making. And I just chalked it off to that. Okay. But now I'm going to put it in a different context. Now it makes more sense to me why I was getting those letters and probably a lot of other people also begging people to come ski up in Colorado. So here's the context. In the mid 80s, the dollar was at a peak. It was very strong. Okay. So here we have, say, Vail Incorporated. Okay. Vail is a, a publicly traded company and they're a ski resort in Colorado. And they, they probably own other ski resorts or all in the United States. But in any case, that's the name of the entity. Now, when you think of Vail, are all their sales in dollars? They are, right? Because you, you, you go to Vail and you know, you know here's, here's American money for lift tickets, here's American money to stay at your restaurants, and here's American money to stay in your hotels and to rent skis. You know, all, all their sales are in dollars, right? Now, what are their costs? Are their costs in dollars? They are, right? They pay the lift operators in dollars, they pay the ski instructors in dollars, etc. So all of their sales and costs are in dollars. And so do they ever, ever have to change money, dollars into euros or whatever? They don't, right? So can you give me a reason why when the dollar is very strong, when it's at, at a peak, why that would be bad for Vail Incorporated. Why they might, for example, have to send letters to people like me or you or whoever practically begging us to go ski in Vail. Well, if the dollar is very strong, then ceteris paribus, all else being equal, am I more likely or less likely to go ski in Switzerland instead of Colorado? More likely, right? Because if the dollar is very strong, then what that means is that, hey, you know, I can get more Swiss francs or fewer Swiss francs for my, for my dollars. More Swiss francs, right? And so therefore, I'm more likely to go ski in Switzerland. And what about the other way around? Let's think of the Swiss. If the dollar is very strong relative to the Swiss franc, say, and therefore the Swiss franc is weak relative to the dollar, are the Swiss more likely or less likely going to ski in Colorado? Less likely, right? 
Why? Because if the Swiss franc is weak relative to the dollar, because the dollar is strong, then will they need more Swiss francs or fewer Swiss francs to buy the dollars to ski in Colorado? They'll need more Swiss francs, right? And so therefore, here's an example of an entity, and it's called operating or competitive exposure because your know, prices are free to fluctuate. There's no, there's, they're non-contractual, hasn't been locked in. And so Vail with, has all of its sales in dollars, all of its costs in dollars. It never has to change money, and yet it is at the mercy of exchange rates. When the dollar gets very strong, ceteris paribus, the value of Vail is going to go down. So what do they have to do when the dollar is very strong to, to, to attract people in their resorts, to their resorts? They have to lower their prices, which they're free to do. It's, you know, it's non-contractual. They have to lower their prices to attract people to come ski. And so that's an example of operating or competitive exposure. So what I want to do today, basically, is, is go through a number of examples. And what I want to talk about is how... The, not the, the, the nominal exchange rate, because we, we saw in previous lectures that the nominal rate is a function of what two things? The nominal rate is a function of real and expected inflation, right? Okay, so, um, so, so the nominal rate is a function of the real rate plus expected inflation, that's, that's an approximation. And so we've already seen about the role that relative inflation pays, plays on exchange rates. And so what I want to do now is, is focus on real exchange rate changes as we go through examples of operating or competitive exposure. So example number one, okay, a domestic firm, all it's buying and all it's selling, okay, so all of its sales and all of its costs are in the U.S. How can a company like that be impacted by real exchange rate changes? Well, what about the example we went through, right? Vail, okay, Vail never has to change money, okay? All of its, all of its sales are in dollars. If you go ski in Vail, you, you'll pay them in dollars, and all of their costs are in dollars, so they pay their lift operators in dollars. They never, ever have to change money. And as we discussed, if the dollar is very strong, are people more likely or less likely going to ski in Switzerland and not Vail? More likely, right? Why? Because it takes fewer dollars to buy the Swiss francs to ski in Switzerland. And conversely, are the Swiss more likely or less likely going to ski in Colorado? Less likely, right? Because they'll need more Swiss francs to buy the dollars to ski in Colorado. So in other words, your foreign competition is basically what Vail is at the mercy at when it is a purely a domestic firm. So in these future examples, now that we have understand the role of foreign competition, we've, we've isolated that, let's just pretend we'll, we'll, there's no foreign competition so we can just focus on other factors, okay? So example number two, imagine a domestic firm, we're, we're talking U.S., so we're, I'm teaching this from the U.S. perspective. So we've got a domestic firm, we're ignoring foreign competition, and they have all their sales in the U.S., but they buy from abroad. Now, if all their sales are in the U.S., do their dollar revenues fluctuate with exchange rates, or does it stay the same? It stays the same, right? Because they don't have to, that their revenues don't go up and down according to exchange rate movements. But what about their costs? Okay, let's say they need, um, I don't know, um, uh, toys from China or, or, or um, steel from Europe or, or whatever, okay? Do, do, does the amount they'll pay in dollars depend upon the exchange rate? It does, right? So in other words, you know, if they buy from abroad, the American firm buys from abroad, their dollar costs will go up and down according to changes in the exchange rate. So... Let's think of a scenario, okay? What happens if the dollar weakens? 
I mean, what would you do? This is your company, okay? And so you, you sell stuff in the United States, but you buy from abroad. And, and, and now the dollar weakens. Well, if the dollar weakens, do you need more dollars or fewer dollars to buy stuff from abroad? You need more dollars, right? So, so this is impacting your bottom line, right? This is, this is affecting you all. What would you personally do? Okay, well, let me, let me give you an example. This is a, a real example. I don't know why this example sticks in my mind, uh, but it relates to wine, okay? And, uh, and it's a very old example, too, because this is back in the mid-'90s. I forget. I think it was uh, the first few months in, in 1995, and the dollar rapidly weakened. And the reason it rapidly weakened is because Mexico had just gone through a devaluation. They just had a year or two of, of high-risk events. They had uh, Indian uprising and a couple, as I recall, prominent politicians assassinated and et cetera, et cetera. And, and around Christmas time, they were forced to devalue their currency. Now, you're probably saying, well, that's Mexico, right? What does that have to do with the United States? Well, is it fair to say that the Mexican economy and the U.S. economy, to some degree, that the their two economies are, are integrated? They are, right? In fact, Me Mexico is one of the U.S.'s largest trading partners. And so, if Mexico goes down, does that, to some extent, also drag the U.S. down, at least relative to other countries whose economies are not that tied into Mexico? It would, right? So, so basically, the, the U.S. dollar weakened very rapidly. And the article I remember reading was about a French wine importer. Okay? So here you have an American firm, and they sell French wine to customers in the U.S., but they bring the French wine from, from France. They import it from France. And so to the extent that they import that wine from France... Does that mean they would need more dollars or fewer dollars to, to buy that French wine? They'd need more dollars, right? So what could they do? Okay, if I, if I draw a little diagram. Okay, so here, here you are in the U.S. Okay, and here's France. Okay, so basically they've got wine... They've got wine coming in from France to the U.S., but it's costing them more. So what could they do? Well, let me ask you this. Just because the dollar weakened relative to the euro, or actually at that time it was probably still the French franc, but just because the dollar weakened relative to, say, the French franc, does that mean that it weakened relative to all other countries in the world? It doesn't, right? In fact, it had actually strengthened against the Chilean peso. Okay? And uh, so, so what this wine importer did was he said, you know what? I'm going to start getting some of my wine from Chile. And to the extent the dollar had strengthened against the Chilean peso. I think I had that right. I think it's the Chilean peso. Does that Would that mean they'd need more dollars or fewer dollars to bring in that wine from Chile? Fewer, right? In other words, what they did was they shifted their costs. What else might they have done? Well, you might have the idea, well, hey, let's buy wine from California, right? But you don't even have to change money. In, in, in both cases, they're shifting their costs. Now, here's my question for you. Do you think shifting costs is, is free or there's some cost related to shifting costs? In other words, when this wine importer okay, started bringing wine in from Chile, okay, so they probably still brought it from France, but maybe a little bit less, but now also from Chile and, and maybe also from California, do you think that setting up those contacts and distributions and, and so on and so forth, do you think 
that was all done without cost or there was a certain amount of cost associated with making those changes? Well, presumably there was a certain amount of cost associated with making those changes, right? And so, so basically, my question is, but once that's done, is this now a stronger wine importing entity? It is, right? Because now what, they, what this, what this uh, wine company can do is, is now they can shift back and forth between these places and, and, and the United States and actually take advantage of exchange rate movements. And is that more likely true the more costless it is to shift the costs? It is, right? I mean, to the extent that they've streamlined operations such that it's very inexpensive to decide, all right, well, I think I'll get less wine from France and, and more wine from Chile, to the extent that they can do that relatively without cost, now is it fair to say they're actually taking advantage of exchange rate movements instead of being at the mercy? It is, right? And so, so that's basically what this company did. You know, maybe you've heard of Chilean wine now. And, and so, so now they're, they're in a position, by the way, of, of shifting costs according to their advantage. Now, does that same concept, you know, we've discussed it in terms of exchange rates, does that, would that same concept apply to any differences that exist just because a border exists? It would, right? I mean, for example, uh, what about regulations or taxes? You know, are, are all those equal among countries? They're not, right? So in other words, if, if it's to the benefit of a company to shift, in this example, costs with anything, maybe there's, there's more regulations imposed in France and, and fewer in Chile. That might be a reason to buy more wine from Chile. Well, maybe Chile adds a huge tax and France doesn't. That might be a reason to import more wine from France. So in other words, this whole concept of shifting costs doesn't just apply to exchange rate. It applies to any differences that exist just because you cross a border. It could include natural cost differences too. You know, maybe, maybe labor, I don't know this for a fact, but maybe labor is, uh, is very involved in, in reaping the harvest with, with wine. Okay, so, so maybe cheap labor. Uh, I, I don't know, but the point is anything where there are differences that exist just because you're crossing a border, well, in that situation, to the extent that you're taking advantage of those differences, is that a case of being threatened by differences that exist around the world or, or celebrating the differences that exist throughout the world. That'd be celebrating, right? Now, in the example I just gave, right, the French wine importer, well, why not just hedge with futures? Well, you could hedge with futures, but, but how long might a future go out for maximum? You know, maximum, certainly a year or less, right? And so, in other words, hedging with futures or other types of hedges, that's going to give you uh, some time, if you will, to make a, a longer-term strategic adjustment. All right, let's look at another example. So here we have, again, we're ignoring foreign competition. We've got a, a domestic firm, so U.S. firm. And now they do all their buying in the U.S., but they do all their selling abroad. Okay. So if they do all their buying in the U.S., do they ever have to change money? They don't, right? So, so does the exchange rate impact their costs if we ignore foreign competition? It doesn't, right? And so buying in the U.S., their dollar costs are going to stay the same. But what about selling abroad? Will the exchange rate have an impact on their sales? It will, right? So for example... If the dollar strengthens, is that happy face or sad face? Well, let's look at Caterpillar Tractor. Okay, in fact, I'll give you another real story here in just a second with Caterpillar Tractor. But if we look at Caterpillar Tractor, and, and so they're selling their tractors to, say, Russia, and the dollar strengthens, 
Are the Russians going to need more rubles to buy the dollars, to buy the tractors, or fewer rubles? They'll need more rubles, right? So, so let me let me give you a a quick example. Okay, um, I remember that here, here's here's the example. I remember in 1985 that I bought Caterpillar tractor stock. Okay, so so in the mid 80s, I bought Caterpillar tractor stock. If you want, you can say I gambled on some stock. And hey, I got lucky, okay? Because about two years later, you know, I, I sold it, and I sold it at a profit. The stock price went up. Now, Caterpillar Tractor, at the time, they had, just like this, they had all their costs in the U.S., so most of their, if not all of their manufacturing, I hope I have my facts right, was in Peoria, but they were selling the tractors all over the world. In fact, I was one of the guys that would be delivering their tractors and stuff like that on ships. Okay, so here's my question to you. Okay, what would make sense if we relate this to exchange rates? Of course, I had, at the time I had no clue about this, but if we relate this to exchange rates, what would make sense that in '85 the dollar was strong and then it had weakened by '87? Or the other way around, that in '85 it was weak and, it, and the dollar had strengthened by '87? Will be the former, right? Because in '85, if the dollar was very strong, which is when I bought the stock, Ceteris Paribus was that happy face or sad face for their revenues? It was sad face, right? Because with the dollar really strong, again, could the Russians, for example, afford to? I mean, would they need more rubles or fewer rubles to buy the dollars, and then buy the tractors? They'd need more rubles, right? And therefore, were they more likely or less likely to buy as many tractors? Less likely, right? And so Caterpillar re revenues went south, which means they kept their stock price low. Then over the next couple of years, as the dollar weakened, was that good or bad for Caterpillar tractor? That was good, right? Because in the context of my Russian example, what that meant was, would the Russians need more rubles or fewer rubles with a weaker dollar to buy the dollar? They'd need fewer rubles, right? So they would need fewer rubles to buy the dollar, to buy the tractors, which means they'd more likely buy more tractors or fewer tractors. More tractors, right? And so, so basically... Um, that's the, you know that's an another example. So so again, you know what might what might Caterpillar Tractor have done? Well, just because uh, again, just because the dollar has strengthened relative to one country, does that mean that it's strengthened relative to all countries? It doesn't, right? So is it possible that Caterpillar could have changed where it sold its stuff. In other words, maybe sell, sell more stuff, maybe in South America. M maybe the dollar had weakened relative to South American countries. So in other words, the same thought process. And again, the more costlessly a country can do that, does that put them at more of a competitive advantage or less of a competitive advantage? puts them at more of a competitive advantage, right? Um, I'll give you one more example, and this just relates to, this relates to Coke, okay? And again, I may have my numbers wrong here, but, but a long time ago, um, a, uh, I had a guest speaker from Coke come to my class, and Coke, uh, at the time, sorry, I could have this fact, this number wrong, so, so just take it with a grain of salt. But basically, they had these various syrup plants throughout the world, and it was the syrup that would provide the, uh, the ingredient to make Coke at the various bottling companies throughout the world. And at the time, as I recall, they had something like 45 syrup plants throughout the world, and they would have to make decisions on which syrup plant would provide 
the syrup to the various bottling companies throughout the world. Okay, so, so maybe, you know, the syrup plant in Puerto Rico provides syrup for bottling companies in, in, in Mexico and in, in Panama and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, so here's my question for you. Okay, how often do you think Coke would do the analysis to figure out which plant, which syrup plant would be providing the, uh, the syrup for the various countries in different parts of the world. I mean, you think they did that calculation on an annual basis or, or maybe a quarterly basis or, or what? Well, it turns out, at least back then, I don't know what they do now, but it turns out that they did that calculation on, an, on a daily basis. Every day they would decide, they would make that decision. And the fact that they made that decision every day is that supportive, not proof, but supportive of the fact that they could relatively costlessly shift, if you will, their costs, or at least the, the sourcing of this syrup. It does, right? I mean, if they could do this calculation on a daily basis. Now, what do you think were the top reasons why they might shift which syrup plant would provide syrup to which bottling companies? Well, it turns out the top reasons was change in tax rates. The exchange rate was actually number two. But in either case, we're talking about differences, right? And you might be thinking, well, hang on. Yeah, you know, what? Tax rates? I mean, how often do tax rates change, right? But if you think about it, we have hundreds of countries in the world, and even within a country, do we have tons of different tax rates? We do, right? Like here in the United States, I mean, I, I live in Cherokee County, and, and we have there's a different sales tax in Cherokee County than, say, Cobb County. Differences in property taxes, and you know, some states have income taxes, and other states don't, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so when you when you multiply the hundreds of countries that exist by the you know dozens or whatever of tax rates, it becomes a lot easier to imagine how you can how tax rates could change on a daily basis. So again, you know, if we look at this example here, again, we're looking at a situation where the more costlessly a company can change, in this case, the source of their revenues, then are they celebrating international differences or are they threatened by them? They're celebrating them, right? So let's do another example. Okay, again, we're ignoring foreign competition so because we understand the impact that that has. But now, a company has both costs and sales, both abroad and at home. Okay, so, so a couple of points here. Okay, number one, with both costs and sales abroad at home, to the extent that they can costlessly shift both costs and sales, now are they, are they even in more of a position to celebrate the differences that exist or, around the world? Or in other words, to take advantage of risk opportunities that exist because countries are different and because countries have different things to offer. And, and, and that's not a static situation. Uh, countries evolve. So, for example, you know, right now, China is known for what? cheap labor, right? But you're having to move further and further towards inland China to take advantage of that cheap labor. If we rewind the clock back, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, what country had the reputation for cheap labor? Japan, right? Everything was made in Japan. Now everything's made in China. Maybe 30 years from now, you will be reading about made in Vietnam or made in Thailand. In other words, it, it's, a, it's a moving target, right? But a moving target that if companies keep on top of, they can actually take advantage and, and thrive on the dynamic ways in which countries have different things to offer. So that's point number one. Your yeah, point number two, a country, I mean a company that has both costs and sales abroad. In the end, is there a net exposure? 
There is, right? I mean, if you have, if, uh, if the U.S. has maybe um, sales of, uh, of 100 million euros in, in France and, and uh, uh, 80 million of costs in, in Germany, okay, do those offset each other? They do, right? Which means they have something called less net, net exposure. So, we've really already discussed this, but when you shift cost and sales, is that more of a long-term adjustment? Well, it depends, right? I mean, the more costly it is, you could argue, presumably, it's more of a long-term adjustment, which is why we're looking at, you know, how do you manage not just exchange rate risk, but any kind of international risk in a longer-term environment. But the more costlessly a company can make these adjustments, as we've mentioned, are they, are they more at a competitive advantage or less at a competitive advantage? Well, then they'd be more at a competitive advantage, right? And so we've looked at different situations with, with, throughout these slides. You know, what might they do if the real exchange rate got stronger? Or what might they do if they weakened? Again, they would want to make these shifts that were to their benefit and according to their advantage. And again, not just with exchange rates, but any changes. Maybe there's differences in regulations. Maybe there are differences in, in, in who's come to power politically. Maybe there's differences in tax rates, differences in culture, and so on and so forth. So it really all boils down to this one question. Oh, that's not true. That's a little dramatic, okay? But fundamentally, it, it, it boils down to... This question's relatively important. Let me put it that way, okay? What kind of firm is more subject to exchange rate risk. Coke, which is clearly a multinational corporation with sales and costs abroad, or Vail. Vail has all its sales and costs in the United States. Well, which of these two companies is better able to, to profit from exchange rate risks, and, and for that matter, other international risks. Which one is better able to move sales and costs globally according to what is to their advantage? Well, Coke is, right? Because we, as we saw with Vail, if the, do, if the dollar strengthens, is there anything that they can do? There's nothing, right? I mean, they're at the mercy. If the dollar strengthens, it, it's back to sending letters to people like you and me saying, please, please, come ski at our, our resort. We'll, we'll drastically cut prices you know, because of this foreign competition thing. So th there's nothing. Well, that's not totally true. What, what could Vail do? Well, maybe they, maybe they open up a ski resort in Switzerland. And if they do that, now what have they become? Well, they've become a multinational corporation, right? But in the meantime, you could argue that a company like Vail, with all its sales and all its costs in the U.S., is more subject to exchange rate risk, and for that matter, other kinds of international risk than Coke. Because at least Coke, I shouldn't say at least, you know, Coke is able to not only not be threatened by it, but actually to celebrate the differences that exist throughout the world. Now, if you were in my class, what I would do is we would look at articles and, and you know, because you could look, as I've mentioned in other lectures, you can look at stuff that's going on right now today, you know, current events, and, and relate, not in an indirect sense, but in a direct sense, some of what we've been discussing today. There's lots of examples of why companies are doing what they're doing throughout the world. In any case, once again, you know, thank you for joining me on this lecture.
And I hope it was a good learning experience. And I hope to see you in the next and, and final lecture of the International Finance Series when I discuss international political risk. Thank you and goodbye.